thank you, Michael. I'd like to thank Michael Bria for uh, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk about some recent work um, and uh, and the foundation, of course, uh, uh, supporting it. I'm afraid I, I have to speak in English. My my knowledge of German is largely limited to uh, the register of slow reading. I can read it, but uh, we'll leave it at that. This is work, actually, that in many ways has grown out of, uh, has grown out of my uh, earlier work uh, dealing with uh, essentially a number of Japanese Marxists, as well as a few in China. Uh, and uh, I thought that uh, it might be an interesting way of beginning to think about or bringing these people into a broader world, which they were in fact not been denied some sort of entry largely because of, of a number of reasons, the most important of which may have been language itself. This talk seeks to put into uh, question uh, the universalistic claims of Western Marxism, or what is known as Western Marxism, and its presumption of the final completion of capital. It calls for a necessary, or what I call a necessary deprovincializing of Marx and the West, uh, the culturalism that is associated with it in the West, by proposing a return to the founders' earlier explanations of capital's origins and development, which in itself followed a trajectory or a line of development beyond Euro America. Uh, into Asia, Africa, and Latin America. I make no claims of being specialist in these various areas, but I have read a little bit in, uh, of, 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 of some of the some of the thinkers, some of the Marxists in this area. These are the people that I've really, I've actually relied upon. I think it's a very difficult. I think it's really difficult to imagine. Uh, a more important episode uh, in the history of Marxism than its trans transformation or transmutation uh, into the provincial figure uh, the Soviets named Western Marxism. And that, the term really, as many of you know, comes out of Soviet Marxism. To differentiate their own discussions from Georg Lukacs' history and class consciousness. The particular nature of the transformation became more prominent after World War II uh, than in the years before the war, the interwar years, when Maurice Merleau-Ponty revi revitalized uh, its humanistic, or what he believed to be its humanistic dimensions, and Marxists in the West began emphasizing its identity in opposition to Stalinism. But the earlier naming had made it clear that its intention was to show how Lukács' intervention represented a dramatic shift from preoccupations with the production process and organization and the prospects for class struggle as such to the universalizing force of the commodity and its capacity to structure the entirety of the social formation. To become so hegemonic in the Euro-American sphere that it has managed to mask its culturally and politically provincial origins and run the risk of making its claims often appear complicit with capital's own self-representation. This is a familiar story, at least it's a familiar story, I think, in the Western world. This representation derives from the necessary presupposition that the commodity relation has been finally realized everywhere, signaling the accomplishment of what Marx described as real subsumption and capital's total domination of everyday life. This protein, or powerful aptitude, recalls Marx's explanation of how, and I'm quoting from Marx, and when I go like this, it'll be a quote, quoting from Marx, how capital becomes a very mystical thing as such as a power springing forth in its own womb, end of quote. In this narrative, the importance of labor has diminished and value is made to automatically uh, appear from the productive process and consumption. 
Its culture is elastically expanded to fill every pore of society and human activity. In other words, value appears to have trumped history. And I should say that as a historian, it has been, I suppose, one of my principal purposes to try to, to at least bring back, in other words, in, especially in this day and age, in other words, where value theory seems to be hegemonic almost everywhere, the United States, great, the United Kingdom, and probably in good parts of Western Europe, that it might be an interesting idea to try to bring back uh, considerations relating to history itself. This familiar perspective on Marx was partially played out by the so-called Frankfurt School. It's an earlier appropriation of Lukács' analysis of reification and its successive expansion into the cultural disciplines. The perception of a realized capitalism, a real subsumption, was subsequently reinforced in the works of uh, Antonio Negri and his followers to reaffirm capital's own self-image in the pursuit of progress. Both of these examples uh, uh, commonly share the ground of this, the ground of this shit, this change perspective that posits capital's externalization and naturalization, whereby it has subsumed the whole of society. With Frankfurt Marxism, it is the transfer to circulation. Whereas in Negri, productive labor is envisaged as intellectual and immaterial, expressed now in the sovereign subject according to the general intellect. Both, moreover, submitted history to a process, uh, a, a sort of auto-reflection, a unilinear historical progression that permitted the measuring of levels of Western societies have attained against the populations or against populations with histories that differ, providing the justification for the domination of those occupied, those who occupied registers lower down on the scale. Hence the imperative, the imperative to deprovincial, <coughs> to deprovincialize, provincial, deprovincialize, I'm sorry, Marx thus entails not an expanded geographic inclusion, but a broadening of temporal possibilities, unanchored, or unmoored from the constraints of unilinear progressive schemes. For Marxism, the particular circumstances of the Cold War conjuncture cast a shadow over the claims of its long history in Russia and the Soviet Union. Along the way, it also encouraged uh, overlooking and even discounting Marxism's our Marxian thinking uh, in the Soviet zone in the interwar period or interwar and post-war years was largely, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, let me just go back to that. It largely uh, discounted Marxian readings from the colonial and semi-colonial areas uh, of the periphery before World War II and throughout what became known as the Third World. Marxian thinking in the Soviet zone in the interwar and post-war years was largely subsumed by Stalinist theorizations of modernization, whereas in the world beyond Euro-America, in the world beyond Euro-America, it was consigned or regard to either imitation or irrelevance because of its undeveloped status. What Hegel once called countries that were nations or countries or societies that were in permanent standstill considered temporarily retrograde or retrograde or backward, society still belonging to modernity's past that could not only be overcome through bourgeois programs of modernization sponsored by Western developmental assistance. In places like the United States and to some degree in the United Kingdom in the 1960s and 70s, <clears throat> the hegemonic, in other words, social theory was, was something called modernization theory. And much of this had really had to do with development, developmental assistance uh, provided by these societies, which was perhaps another form of neo-colonialism. During the Cold War interim, Western Marxism itself sacrificed the rich and heterogeneous genealogy for the figure of a homogenous interpretive strategy founded on the premise of a uniquely unified geographic configuration 
that had long given up on the anticipated withering of the state, or indeed expectations of imminent world social revolution for critical cultural analysis of capital's domination of the social formation. Much of this was undeniably prompted by a response to the perception earlier enunciated by Walter Benjamin that historical materialism itself was, uh, was literally contaminated by progressive developmentalism. Benjamin's powerful intervention aimed to rescue Marxian historical practice from this fatal affliction, which made so much of it resemble bourgeois historiography. With the move to cultural critique, Western Marxism, especially its promotion of the, the political and social consequences of commodification, inadvertently contributed to reinforcing the realization of capital's claim to real subsumption and thus completion, which seemed to trumpet capital's triumph and echo Benjamin's worst fears concerning the fate of historical materialism. Value now presented itself as self-determining, leading to misrecognitions of it as use value. Once capital finally appeared as an automaton, it occluded value source in living labor and thus changed the perspective to the scene of circulation. This image of an achieved capitalist society in the West was further in the West, further exaggerated the contrast between advanced development and backwardness inevitably marred by the spectacle of unevenness. Parochializing marks, limiting marks, thus activated an adherence to a rigid conceptualization of history's trajectory compelled to uphold a progressive narrative driven by a unilinear unfolding of time all societies must pass through. The scenario was subsequently reproduced in the imagery of the nation form, which became its principal historical vocation. I think it's somewhat perplexing, as well as ironic, that the primary proponents of Western Marxism in the Cold War struggle were more preoccupied with philosophy than history. Yet the move to embrace philosophy obviates the evident irony when contrasted to Marx's earlier decision to re reject the preeminence according to starting from the concept, which he remained, which he renounced as, as, as dreadful. This is a quote from Marx, it's a letter, I think, I forgot to whom, but it was in one of his late letters. This is a quote. I do not proceed from concepts, he charged, hence neither from the concept of value. What I proceed from is the simplest social form in which the product of labor presents itself in contemporary society, and this is the commodity." End of quote. Just as one can only start from the commodity, so one must also start from the present, the temporal location of the commodity. Uh, uh, you know, making, in other words, the past present, presentifying the past, as against merely seeking to represent the reconstructive actualization. It is this explosive encounter of past in the present, uh, Marx and Engels first identified, I should say, in the German ideology as the task of a proper historical vocation, as exemplified in the recognition of Germany's uneven development that later resonated in the resounding uh, but great preface to capital and I quote simply, that we suffer not only from the living, but from the dead, end of quote. A tactical formalism might induce closer attention to those attempts that emphasize the philosophic over the historical, where the concrete, or use value, discloses how the sensuous acts as the bearer or the carrier of the abstract in exchange value. But it is precisely this tension between capital's abstract categories and the materiality of contemporary history unfolding in government reports concerning conditions 
conveyed in Capitol's great chapel chapter on the working day, and their attendance, uh, their attendance struggles Marx addressed in his theoretical elaborations. Here, it seems, he was only showing the constant mixing of historical material and theoretical exposition. Moreover, this bringing together of historical material with general categories underscores the different coexisting temporalities that inform capitalism's structure. It also manages to throw into question uh, its self-representation and how synchronization, the synchronization of time through the implementation of socially uh, necessary labor fails to conceal the uneven times that remain unassimilated as non-contemporary heterogeneous historical forms that become classified as simply anachronisms. Even so, it is in these different temporalities Marx was able to discern historical difference, the non-identity that capital's logic could not tolerate or completely assimilate, which would open the occasion for class struggle, seeking to temporalize the present by producing time's turmoil and discord. Of discordance. In the newer Cold War alignments, Western Marxism's progressive detaching from the economic domain for the cultural, especially aesthetic production, art, and literature contributed to valorizing a specific and, as I said, a provincial cultural endowment as superior and its claims as universal. Regardless of its critical intent, its mode of culturalist discourse appeared closer to Max Weber's conception of the singular uniqueness of Western culture than to a critical undermining of capital, capital's superstructural strongholds. In the more contemporary collision of value and history and the former's capacity to displace the latter reverberates the distant, the distant conflict between history and philosophy Marx put into question in the German ideology. The appeal to philosophy prepared the way for value's contemporary hegemony over history uh, by reinforcing its privilege this was enabled, I believe, because, in a, because of a shared kinship, a shared kinship between philosophy and value dedicated to bracketing the historical worlds of their respective moments. While this, con uh, this contributed further to the formalism characteristic of philosophy and value, it nevertheless committed both to a common referent, which is the human experience of time. Time, or the structure of temporality, both eventually will need to confront since total Im immunization is simply not possible. Philosophy is required to thus reckon with its present and consider its historicity, that is, the theoretical conjuncture, the theoretical conjuncture, in order to stake out a position on it and in its present, whereas value is obliged to come up against its concealed originating source. While the principal casualty stemming from this, uh, the preoccupation of a completed, mature capitalism risks sacrificing historical capitalism, if not the historical itself, this consequence signaled exclusion that failed to take notice of the, dis and I'm quoting again, of the distinct configurations, forms of accumulation process implying other combinations for a commitment to a single, all-encompassing system. <clears throat> But this is counter to Marx's own observations concerning the process of, uh, of, of original accumulation, which as an instance of, quote, expropriation, already assumes different aspects in different countries or societies, and quote, and this is from Marx, runs through its various phases in different orders of succession and at different historical epics, end of quote, despite the English example that has the classic form that we all know about. Marx apparently altered uh, the wording of this passage in the French translation of Capital to propose that, quote, countries in Western Europe are going through the same development, although in accordance with, in, a, in accordance with environmental, ch in, in environment changes 
in accordance with environment changes its local color or confines itself to a narrow sphere or shows a less pronounced character or follows a different order of success, end of quote. The object of capital was never English capital or even the imitation of English capitalism, nor even a certain phase of its development. When Marx wrote that, quote, the country that is more developed industrially shows the less developed the image of its own future, he was not suggesting that all such societies would look like England, but rather the reverse. And I, one of the, perhaps the best example of that is one of the people that I deal with is the Japanese economist, the Marxian economist from the late 1930s and into the post-war period, Uno Kozo. And Uno points out really, you know, that yes, of course, uh, you know, that Japan in the 19th century learned about capitalism uh, largely through the British. I mean, it was really British capitalism or the advanced state of British capitalism that the Japanese, you know, uh, uh, imported. But at the same time, of course, he, he was able to point out, you know, uh, really in a penetrating way that, you know, that, that the Japanese did take a different route. There were things that the Japanese did that simply didn't take place in England, especially the nature of accumulated primitive accumulation, for example. Through the operation of formal subsumption and its purpose to take over what was useful at hand and put it in the service of capitalism, he, uh, uh, Marx, cleared the path to envisioning a perspective to consider the likely possibility of other, other forms of appropriation outside of Western Europe. The introduction of the category of formal subsumption and the corollary and, and its corollary, real subsumption, appeared briefly in earlier editions of Capital's discussion on absolute and relative surplus value. Mentioned in Grun it was mentioned in Grunrisse and considered more fully in the economic notebooks. Uh, 1864-65, uh, about that time, I forgot the dates of that. A fuller version appeared in an appendix to Capital's titled the results of the immediate process of production, which had not been available to earlier generations until the 1930s, that supplied the necessary optic through which to grasp the refractions of specific, specific forms, not stages, forms informing, quote, the restructuring of labor processes to generate super, uh, 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 surplus value, end of quote. The completed, the completed process, which Marx called real subsumption, signified the realization of relative surplus value and the role played by the introduction of technology and the factory system in the increasing production but not shortening the working day. Formal subsumption referred to a prior system of, pro of appropriation in which capital incorporated labor and economic practices derived from earlier modes and subordinated them to capital's uh, pursuit of surplus value. In the Grinders, uh, he says very simply, he says, very simply, capital takes what it can use. <coughs> Excuse me. Whether Marx believed capital would ultimately realize the completion of the commodity relation, even though it would continue to mature from its 19th century state of development, is really hard to know. What seems certain is that he needed such a concept in order to present capital as a completed totality, to literally imagine uh, it's, it's, it's possible completion, uh, which would permit him to submit it to the, the analysis and critique characterizing capital, the book capital. And it's interesting because this is really, and I'm sure all of you are particularly aware of this, this is, a, this is the point at which, of course, you know, Rosa Luxemburg really uh, uh, criticized, seriously criticized Marx's notion of expanded reproduction, where she, where she you know, pointed out that it would have been impossible to, to, to have, uh, to, to expand reproduction the way Marx talked about it uh, uh, with only uh, the capitalist and the worker that you needed, in other words, a third source, basically. And it was at that point where she obviously turned to the world outside of, uh, outside of Europe. This became particularly evident in the account of accumulation in the process in which surplus is, transferred, uh, is trans transformed into capital. But this is not to suggest that forms of subsumption, especially the, vast, the vastly overlooked idea of hybrid forms Marx, uh, Marx mentioned early in Capital, function simply as substitutes on the category of, uh, for the category of transition, nor is it to gesture toward recovery 
of some form of historicist stage theory following a progressive tra trajectory in disguise. It is, however, a way to reinvest, to reinvest the historical text with the figure of contingency and the unanticipated appearance of conjunctural moments that need to be addressed. Marx referred to such specific processes in several texts and emphasized the coexistence of different economic practices in certain moments, in certain, uh, 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 in certain moments, as did many others after him, and the persistence of historical temporal forms rather than merely remnants waiting to be classified as specters of anachrony. It should be recognized that this identification of subsumption was first and foremost a temporal form. It was a temporal concept with diverse manifestations, which often prefigured a certain content and outlasted its moment, its moment of origination. Moreover, this reformulation of the labor process and economic practices was consistent with views that disavowed a unitary model and welcomed the prospect of different routes to national economic development. An accounting, an accounting of the specific manner that labor has been subsumed or used in, formal, in a formal mo modality opens the way to considering the historical or epochal dimensions of the mode of production as it structured the production process, but significantly widens the perspective to include uh, the excluded world beyond Western Europe. Marx repeated on several occasions that, quote, formal subsumption, and I'm quoting from here, is the general form of every capitalist, is of every capitalist process of production. At the same time, however, it can be found as a particular form alongside the specifically capitalist mode of production in its developed form. Another end of quote. In other words, it inaugurates capitalist appropriation of older practices and can coexist alongside mature forms of capitalism. This was especially true of how formal subsumption behaved in the inaugural moments of capital accumulation, in societies where there was not yet clear differentiation between the diverse domains of economic practice, culture, politics, and even religion, which often were seen as integral to the performance of work in persisting modes of production. It is possible to acknowledge how practices from the non-economic realm have continued to interact with capitalist production in places like Asia and Africa, and have frequently seen have been, and 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 have frequently, I'm sorry, and have frequently continued to interact with with capitalist production. I mean, one of the interesting things that 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 you, you get in a writer like Claude Meleso, who's a, a an interesting anthropologist working in West Africa in the in the 1970s, uh, throughout the 1960s so and 1970s, was how, in other words, capitalism kind of fused with with what he called the natural economy. I mean, you know, a natural economy largely devoted to to reproduction. But it is, it, it is, it seems to me, equally evident that Marx envisions the operation of formal subsumption as an ongoing process, continuing with and alongside the development of a maturing capitalism. Lenin earlier observed that, quote, the labor service system passes into the capitalist system and merges with it to the extent that it becomes almost impossible to distinguish one from the other, end of quote an insight that lay at the heart of his magisterial work, The Development of Capitalism in Russia. Lukács, uh, the founder, the, uh, the, the putative founder, the alleged founder of Western Marxism, explained a similar phenomenon in his perceptions drawn from the, from the mixture of capitalism and older practices in Central Europe and the process of, quote, naturalizing these residues to make them appear as results of a mature capitalism. His task was to show that many of the practices taken over and used by capital logic and recognized as fully capitalistic had derived from historical presuppositions prior to capital. They were not produced by capital's, capital's uh, presuppositions, even though they appeared to, as he puts it, they appeared to the bourgeois mind to be the products of the latter. In other words, the bourgeois mind, as he put it, 
saw the completion of capitalism, real subsumption if you want to call it, as a necessity when and, uh, when and where it hadn't yet occurred, even though the bourgeois mind was apparently looking at the result of formal subsumption and still living in a society filled with reminders of historical unevenness. In the 1860s and after, Marx began to extend and enlarge, not change his perspective. In the broad scheme of possibilities, the most appropriate uh, the most appropriate figure for development was unevenness, at least as far as I'm concerned, and the temporal demand and dislocations it is capable of unleashing. Each president then supplies a multiplicity of lines of lines of development, as he proposed in his draft letters to Vera Zasovich, the Russian populist that he had written those letters that he never sent. The Russian context encouraged him to alter his views on the question of historical progress and envision, envision how the promise offered by the surviving Russian commune play an active role in the national economy once it had freed itself gradually from primitiveness. And don't misunderstand me. I mean, he was not in favor of, of the commune as such, and he did ultimately say that Russia will have to undergo some form of uh, social revolution. But he was willing here at this particular point, in other words, to recognize you know, the existence, the contemporary existence, in other words, of these archaic forms and how they might, in fact, be used, in other words, in uh, national economic development uh, in Russia. Yet he wrote, and I'm quoting, precisely because it is contemporary, contemporaneous, he's really talking about the commune, because it is contemporaneous with capitalist production, the rur rural commune may appropriate all its achievements without undergoing quote, its frightful vicissitudes, end of quote. Marx clearly, clearly saw the utility of appropriating this archaic residue under revised conditions uh, to enhance the development of contemporary capitalism and, and portrayed it as an element, as, and this is a quote again, as an element in the regeneration of Russian society he thus advised Zasovich that, quote, we should not then be too frightened of the word archaic, end of, end of the quote. What appeared important for Marx was the status of contemporary coexistence of the archaic, the archaic and modern forms of economic production and the realization that the relocation of the archaic in the present redefined the residue by stripping it of degraded cultural, political, and economic associations belonging to a more distant mode of production in which they had functioned. They were now, of course, placed in a new context and serving new, uh, you know, a different historical configuration and serving, in other words, a new, a new function. In this way, Marx provided a pathway for considering plural possibilities for the transformation of societies outside Western Europe. Above all else, the hitherto excluded societies of the periphery would no longer be required to do, depend on the roots marking moments of capital's ascent in the West and the colonizing experience mandated by a rigid linear stage theory of replication. Hence, I think, you know, this is the, 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 the major point that I've been trying to make, of course, uh, uh, is that we have a diversity of thinkers from different places and times who could draw upon the utility of a number of received surviving historical temporal forms that had originated earlier to create a new register, a new register of formal and hybrid forms of subsumption in Europe's margins as Rosa Luxemburg certainly recognized in Africa and no doubt Eastern Europe, Antonio Gramsci's program for the Italian semi-feudal South, Jose Carlos Mariatigi's observations concerning contemporary non-contemporaneity in Peru and others throughout a in Asia. This broader global perspective reaching societies beyond Europe meant concentrating attention on labor and production which constituted a return to making history to, uh, in the present rather than values put, uh, putative auto-valorizations 
that effaces anterior forms uh, such as history. History put into permanent question capital's pretense that it was a, <clears throat> a timeless and self-regenerating economy of universal value and upheld the truth that it was everywhere based on the exploitation of labor for surplus value. Historical difference also rescued Marx's interest in pre-capitalist formations, particularly what he identified as historical presuppositions that would show both the historicity of the modes of production and how capital managed to naturalize its process to effectively eternalize itself by expunging its own historical or removing its own historical emergence. The operation of formal subsumption set up the temporal structure of every present by altering it through its repetitive mission to appropriate what it found useful in prior practices and procedures. If capitalism is seen, as it is certainly today, to be seeking the establishment of the force of value to achieve predictable sameness in the commodity relation, it paradoxically is also or was also capable of producing the very difference, historical non-identity, it is currently dedicated to eliminating. Marx described this agenda early in the German ideology as, a, as the tempo of development that proceeds slowly. Quote, the various stages and interests are never completely overcome, but only subordinated to the prevailing interests, he wrote, and retained in the, quote, possession of a traditional power in the illusory community, a power which in the last resort can be broken by revolution, end of quote. With its capacious capacity for confronting every present with a new content derived from the past and accompanied by continuing traces of original accumulation, formal subsumption, the general logic of all capitalist development, not only appropriated, not only appropriated what was useful and near at hand, but also designated a division between what was outside what was outside of it uh, considered as different uh, to incorporate and combine it with what was inside. This process of combining in capitalist system of production aimed to naturalize differences and make them appear that they naturally belong there. Moreover, this different, these different practices were metabolized in such a way as to project them back to appear as capitalist's own presupposition and proof of its claims to a natural history. In Grunrisse, Marx described this as capital's becoming, that it constantly absorbs these outside and non-capitalist elements and makes them part of its metabolic order, which in every case of development would present itself as completed and identical with its origins. The successive writings of Lenin, Luxembourg, Gramsci, Mariazegui, Uno, Wang Yanan, and others share a common ground of being able to see through the logic of capitalist development in the process of labor and production that required bringing together received practices from different pasts with capitalist new demands. With these various interventions, we have instances of how these temporal historical forms from older modes of production were put to use in an emergent capitalist environment incorporating them as if they naturally belong to capital's internal mechanism and operations. For this reason, I have tried to show that these diverse efforts must be seen not as part of an undifferentiated, elongated shadow of Marx, but the inheritors of the founder's expansive vision that in enabled each in their own way to become Marx after Marx. When Marx, for example, observed in the American South the fusion of ancient slave labor and capitalist cotton production for the world market, reiterated, as I said by, later by Luxembourg, he had already provided the empirical template, the empirical template for the operation of formal subsumption. In this, he was followed by Lenin's acknowledgement of the, yeah, I'm just finishing up right now, okay? In this, in this, he was followed by Lenin's acknowledgement of the capitalist nature of medieval handicraft production in Russia, 
Luxembourg's call for combining non-capitalism with capitalist accumulation in colonial expropriation, her insistence on the necessity of capital to rely on non-capitalism to achieve expanded reproduction, Gramsci's recommendations to, to joining Italy's northern industry and the South semi-feudal uh, colonial agriculture, Mariategui's identification of Inca communalism, Spanish feudalism and modern capitalist components as coexisting in Peru as a frozen palimpsest, comparable to the congealed semi-feudalism and semi-colonialism that constituted capitals formed throughout Asia and South, East and South Asia. Uh, I just want to say one more word about a conclusion. I'll just, can I, can I just, just give me a word, okay? I just said, well, I, I, there are a number of things that you can say about this, but the thing that I would like to emphasize, or at least draw to your attention, is that throughout my argument, my, throughout, my argument has emphasized that, that during the time Marxism in the West turned inward and exclusionary, resigned to the defeat of the working class and eventually dedicated to the effects resulting from the completed commodity relation and the reign of abstract value, the odyssey of Marxism to the world beyond Europe retained the original optimism of the founders in the commitment to attending to the immense consequences of capital, capitalism's developmental traject, trajectory for the organization of labor and production. What this experience showed was a devoted adherence to the diverse ways of making history, which meant identifying the logic of capitalist development rooted in the exploitation of labor power in pursuit not of value, but of surplus value. In the West, exploitation, exploitation of, 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 uh, of humans and nature had been replaced by abstract values and how it came to exert everywhere forms of social domination that would presumably explain collective alienation. But it was exploitation itself that revealed capitalist abstraction and thus the hidden source of alienation embodied in humans and not someplace else. In other words, it was the history of lived exploitation inscribed in capital's different developmental roots that disclosed the demands of abstract wealth. Yet in spite of the vast disparity of pathways by capitalist development, it still remained a constant as history of exploitation. It is in this regard that Jose Carlos Mariategui described best the importance of history, a history that defined a future that would remain in history, and I'll end with this quote. We confess that we are in the dimension or in the domain, in the domain of the temporal, the historic, and that we have no intention of abandoning, abandoning them. We have the spirits incapable, we leave the spirits incapable of, expect, of accepting and understanding their epic to their sterile afflictions and tearful metaphysics, end of quote. Thank you very much, Harry. Uh, I do not know if anybody else has read this book. I think I, the Rosa Luxemburg Library is the only library, at least in Berlin, who has it already here. Can you buy it? We bought it. Can we buy it? No. It's, <laughs> it's possessed, possessed by our library. You can, you can, <laughs> you can uh, take it um, uh, and give it back to us. Yeah, it's the only way. But um, um, when, we, when I read this book, um, I found it interesting. Um, there are different at attempts now to go back to Marx in, in maybe in a little bit the same way as you are doing. The first, of course, is you are not um, referring to it, but it's, of course, feminism, who is proving that um, you are taking in your book the idea that uh, of what you are calling Western Marxism that or that capitalism is transforming the whole society, the whole world into uh, something uh, um, like you are calling real subsumption to capital. All is looking 
like capital, capital labor trans, uh, relations and so on. And this was a very strong point already at Rosa Luxemburg's uh, time. And she said, look on the real world. The relation between labor and capital is only a part. And it, at her time, it's a small part in a, in a worldwide uh, situation where a, a larger part of the real work and the real relations was not um, um, what Marx would call real subsumption to capital. Then came the feminist movement, said, okay, look on housework, look on care work, and so on. The majority of work done in our society is done not in capital labor relations. Again, it's done in, um, um, at, the, at the informal sector, at the household sector, at um, even slave labor, at Marx time already, slave labor played a very important role. Uh, and so on. Then came the ecological movement, saying, look, we are speaking about the exploitation of labor, forgetting about the exploitation of uh, female work, of non-paid work, uh, and we are forgetting about the exploitation of nature. Uh, so we had uh, Rosa Luxemburg lecture by um, different colleagues stressing this point of um, um, and you are, what I found interesting in your book, you are replacing the idea, which is you're referring often to Lukács, um, uh, the problem of everything will be commodified and also even our thinking. For, and this was a very strong, let's say, idea, metaphor, also of Marcuse, the yeah. one-dimensional yeah. man and yeah. so on. Yeah. And you are making clear, uh, or you are stressing the point that the central relation is not commodification but formal subsumption. That means capital does not try to transfer everything into commodities. Even if it's a strong tendency, all the time non-commodity forms are right. created. Right. Um, it's not, you are, and this I found uh, very special. You are uh, addressing and using very different authors uh, of Marxism, of non-Western Marxism, to prove that history is reproduced in the, uh, the past is reproduced in the present. What um, um, my f I have two questions. Um, let's start with this, and then I will open to the floor. Um, first. Um, where this idea come from for yourself, from of your, let's say, intellectual biography, yeah? where you found the starting point to work in, in this very special direction, which I think is very important. The second is um, two of the authors are here of this book, das Kommunistische. Yeah? Ich mache jetzt mal Werbung, I make some advertisement for this book here. <laughs> Ähm, oder ein Gespenst kommt nicht zur Ruhe. Ähm, Friederike Habermann und Binia Damchang sind hier, die ähm, das mit an dem Buch geschrieben haben. In this book we are also referring to the discussion of äh, Marx and Vera Sasulic ähm, ähm, in, the, in, in, in 18, äh, ja, 1881. Ähm, what I would like to ask you, ähm, you are making strong the point that the, uh, the past is recreated in the present. I would say that uh, even also in Marx's work, for him the idea is very strong that the future is created in the present. That the non-capitalist or forms going beyond capitalism are created in capitalism itself. He's referring to this with, with the, the problem uh, even to, to England, with uh, the problem of uh, the regulation of the working day, where he says that this is a political economy of labor, not of capital. That means planning and regulating and uh, de the decommodification of somehow of labor and with regard at least to labor time. Um, this is in conflict, of course, to the idea of real subsumption. Uh, it's a very ambivalent thing. Also, he refers to the cooperative movement of in, in the spirit of Robert Owen, 
in his time and we may say that there are a lot of other tendencies uh, emerging in the society in the in the west but let's say also in the east and china and other countries planning regulating um, and um, but so it's for him communist revolution was setting free these elements what i also would like to stress is these elements of the future somehow reminding ideas of the past that means what you are saying time matters place matters location matters um, uh, non-work matters and so on all this reminds uh, us of pre-capitalist societies that's right and pre-capitalist right. civilizational right. achievements so uh, maybe this is also in line with your but when marx argued with um, uh, sasulic that the communist or socialist revolution should combine the revolution in the west with revolutions in the east right. because we should bring to the future achievements of pre-capitalist uh, societies destroyed in the west so my two points were firstly where this comes this attraction from marx in the special um, uh, direction and secondly i would like to ask you um, you are stressing the problem of the past and the present i would ask you if there's also the idea that uh, the future and the future and the past and the combination of the future and the past of, in the present is a problem we should be concerned because if we want to go beyond capitalism we need this a new combination so okay uh, uh, <coughs> take the mic uh, as for the first, where does this all come from? Uh, actually, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's it, that would be that would get us far astray. I mean, part of it has to do. Part of it has to do with 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 spending a lot of time dealing with the world outside of Europe, and you know, when I first went to Asia, you know, when I first went to Japan. It was part of the third world. I mean, I mean, it was just. I mean, it was. You know, and it, you know, and there's still pockets. I mean, even you know, when you go back, I mean, you you recognize it. And you begin it was to it the 1950s? Or? Yeah, it was in the late 50s. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, and you know, you you begin to recognize. You know, in other words, you know, on regular trips, that you know, some pockets still retain the or get altered somewhat, but. You know, you don't even have to go to Japan. You can go to New York City. I mean, you can. I can show you places, in other words, which which really represent another world altogether. Go to Chinatown. So yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, if you if if, if you want to, Jewish I mean, corner. And, and so that, and I begin to wonder. I mean, I had, you know, it's, part of it has to do with just reading some of the stuff. You know, you begin to read many of these people like Negri, and I had a colleague, you know, people like Moishe Stone for a long time, and I couldn't understand what they were talking about. I said, you know, I have, I've actually once said, I said, what world do you live in? I mean, have you ever been to Italy? I mean, there's something like Negri. I mean, have you ever been to Southern Italy? I mean, for, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, how can you talk in terms of, you know, a kind of, 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 of an immaterial Marxism completed, you know, uh, and anyway, it was largely through, you know, that kind of essentially empirical experience. In other words, a kind of a disjunction, uh, you know, a disjuncture between the kinds of things that I was seeing and I was essentially studying and writing about, in other words, and what people were trying to do with, with these, these elaborate representations. And I began to think that, yeah, there's a real, there's a real kind of separation be going on here between representation and some form of actualization, not that I have a claim to being more authentic or anything like that, but I said you have to account for this kind of thing. And, and that really goes back to something you had said a moment ago, and as I, that I've always felt that, that, that the problem of commodification has always been overstated. And all, you know, that, 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 pe that people live lives, you know, there was, that are entirely commodified. But we're always producing, in other words, ways by which to elude the, you know, forms of commodification. That you know there are non-commodified forms. I mean, you know, and as I say, and we're capable of producing them. That we don't live our lives as if, in fact, you know, we're 
where robots are automatons, in other words, you know, being disposed by some sort of, you know, some sort of large subject with a capital S, in other words, or V value or so forth. That, so that basically, yeah, it was it was that sense, and you can see this, you can see that when you begin to study some of these people outside of Europe, they're not particularly concerned with that problem, and you know for very good reasons. I mean, and you you wonder, you know, why are there? I mean, they're they're much more closer, obviously, to to these pre ma these pre capitalist formations, but those those formations do not, you know, disappear overnight. And they leave their traces and their residues. Whether you know whether you're talking about advanced, you know, industrial societies like Germany or the United States or, or France or what have you, or Japan, which is of course, you know, certainly uh, is the, the best example of, of that kind of development I can think of, or whether or not it, you know, it's 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 still you know, um, areas in other words which you haven't made that 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 uh, ascent. Uh, your second question is, 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 is an interesting one. It's, it's not that I wasn't interested in the future. One of the reasons why I didn't, I mean, I, was, I felt that I, I needed to emphasize, in other words, this particular relationship between past and present because it's largely through Marx, Marx and Engels. And I mean, I, you know, you go, when you go back to something like German ideology, I mean, it's there. That's where the relationship is first made. And of course, there's also thinking about you know, some form of future that's already encapsulated the present. There's no question about that. But I wanted, I actually didn't feel that I was competent or able, in other words, to kind of deal with that problem along the way. I mean, as to what, I mean, and as you're right, I mean, the point is, is that, that they spend so much time, in other words, you know, uh, and Marx especially, you know, throughout so much of his writing, spent so much time, in other words, kind of, you know, dredging up these presuppositions, these historical presuppositions, where you know, you know, they're constantly reminding you, in other words, that you know that the past, in other words, does you know does that plays a very active role, in other words, in the present. There's no reason to exclude the future from that, basically. I mean, there's no none whatsoever. I mean, especially you know, and if you're referring to certain kinds of progressive development, like you pointed out, in terms of, you know, labor organizations or cooperatives. Oh, but I, I remember those those sections. But basically, I didn't feel that I was a, at that at the point that I was writing this that I could deal with that problem, uh, you know, as well. And then the other thing about it is I didn't want to get back into some sort of, 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 of linear trajectory, basically. That I didn't want to exclude it, but I also, and I don't exclude, I don't obviously don't exclude, but I didn't want to get back into on the one hand, a linear trajectory, in other words, which, you know, suggests that in the end, you know, the future is, you know, uh, you know, will lead. I mean, I, uh, part of it, you may have noticed, I don't really talk much about transition in that no. book, and I don't really believe, I think that's also an overstated category. And I didn't want to get into that situation where, you know, where the, the you know, where the, I mentioned it, for instance, that the, the, the whole problem of the transition, as far as I'm concerned, that's, talk, uh, that's talked about by generations of Marxism, really has to do, it's a, it's a European idea, it has to do with feudalism, it has to do with feudalism into modernity, but it really has to do with the transition yet to come. And I, you know, that's something that I really didn't feel particularly qualified to speak to. I mean, that transition hasn't yet happened. And that's number one. Secondly, I didn't want to get into this kind of historicist uh, uh, line of argument, you know, made by you know uh, uh, a number of uh, you know uh, historians, you know, where where they see you know the present as uh, filled with expectation of the future and anticipation. Nobody would deny that that anticipation or expectations uh, exist in the present, always about what is yet to come. But there's no way you can really talk about it in any kind of, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, authoritative way other than merely to to call attention to in other words that possibility but I wouldn't certainly deny it its existence uh, hey thank you very much and I hope we can continue this discussion Marx after Marx and socialism after socialism thank you very much. Right. Thank you.